Isaiah chapter 16. Now we're coming into some difficult chapters. And I don't expect you to think that I know everything about the Bible. Because I don't know everything about the Bible. But we're going to go through them and just try our best to figure out what the Lord's saying. And we'll get something out of it. Even if you don't know what's going on, you still get something out of it. That's the way the Bible is. Maybe you don't know what's going on. But there'll be little phrases and things in there that'll give you some light along the way. So chapter 16 and verse 1 says, Send ye the Lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. What this chapter is about is Isaiah's burden to Moab, the burden of Moab. Just like in chapter 15, it started out in verse 1, the burden of Moab. So it's a continuation of that. And you see, Moab, during the tribulation, Moab will be confederate with armies that attack Israel. And the Lord's going to wipe most of them out, but there's going to be a little remnant left. And it says in Isaiah 16, 14, But now the Lord has spoken, saying, Within three years, as the years of an hireling, and the glory of Moab shall be contemned with all that great multitude, and the remnant shall be very small and feeble. So Moab, they're going to be confederate with armies that are against Israel, but the Lord's going to kill most of them. They're going to be a, a little remnant. They're going to be very small and feeble. Now that's what I want to talk about is, you need to realize you're little, realize you're small and feeble, and God is big. We have a really big God. You're small and feeble. You're nothing, but God is big. Now, some people already realize they're small and feeble. God's knocked them around, allowed the devil to knock them around, and they realize it, but <clears throat> a lot of people out there, they think they're big and strong, but really they're small and feeble. So, chapter 16, verse 1, let's look at it. The first thing I want to say is, realize you're small and feeble, Realize God is big and take his side. That's the first thing. You need to take his side. You might as well go ahead and line up with him and take his side. So he says, Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. He says, Send ye the lamb. Now that's talking about sending tribute. You know, they uh, need to make peace with Judah. And send tribute to them. Kind of like Misha did back there in 2 Kings 3-4. I'll, I'll tell you what that says real quick. In 2 Kings 3-4, it says, And Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep master. And he rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. So he sent all these lambs to Ahab trying to make peace sending over tribute so he says in Isaiah 16 1 send ye the lamb you know don't be like a Cain over there in Genesis 4 that only wanted to send the Lord the fruit of the ground you need to be like Abel that offered the first things of his flock so he says send ye the lamb you know let the Lord know that you're on his side it says send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land. Well, who's the ruler of the land? It'll be the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to be the ruler in the kingdom. In Psalm chapter 110, verse 1, it says, A psalm of David, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. He's the ruler of the land. 
So send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land. Send something to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can send him a prayer. You can send him pieces of your time throughout the day. The Lord gave you something. He laid down his life for you. You can give him something. Send you the lamb to the ruler of the land. From Selah. So what's Selah? Well, Selah Petra. You hear that out th throughout the Bible. Petra is a is carved out of the rocks. It's a hiding place. It's where the Jews are going to hide during the tribulation. Selah Petra. Uh, Selah means rock. Like petrified. It's petrified, you see. So it says, Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness. You see that word Selah throughout the book of Psalms spelled S-E-L-A-H. And every time you see that word, it puts you in the context of the second coming or the tribulation. And it, uh, that Selah Petra is where the Jews are going to hide during the tribulation. And it says here in uh, 16.1, Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness unto the mount of the daughter of Zion. What's the mount of the daughter of Zion? We'll look at Isaiah 10.32. In Isaiah 10 and verse 32, it says, And, ye, and as yet shall he remain at Nob that day. He shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. So the mount of the daughter of Zion is the hill of Jerusalem. Told you plainly there. And Jesus Christ is the ruler of the land. He's going to reign in Jerusalem. So they're going to need to send a lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness and to the mount of the daughter of Zion. And Psalm 46, 7, it says, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. See that? How it, it'll show up in the tribulation and second coming context, that word Selah. So he says in Isaiah 16 and verse 2, For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest to the daughters of Moab, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. See, you need to take his side because you're helpless without him. You see, Moab's going to be like a wandering bird cast out of the nest. They're helpless. No place to go. What hope do you have? What hope would they have? Wandering birds have little hope for survival. You might as well come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when Noah let those birds out of the ark, that dove came back, it had little hope for survival. It, had, it didn't have no place to rest his foot. You don't have no place to rest your foot. You got little hope for survival. You might as well take the Lord's side. Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness. You're just a wandering bird cast out of the nest. You need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. Now, the fords is waters you can walk through on foot. And they're going to be at the fords of Arnon. So they'll ford through the fords to get to see La Petra. They're going to come to the Lord. They're going to come to that hiding place because that's going to be the only hope they have. And you need to remember, that's what you need to do. You need to go where the Lord is because you don't have any hope. Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness and to the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be that as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon. Then he says this, Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as the night in the midst of the noonday, hide the outcasts, 
be Ray, not him that wondereth. So you need to take his side. The second thing you need to do is take counsel, execute judgment. All right, what's this counsel and judgment he wants them to do? Well, he says in verse 3, Make thy shadow as the night in the midst of the dune day. Hide the outcasts. Bewray not him that wondereth. So let's look at this counsel that the Lord gave them that he wants them to take. Uh, he says, Make thy shadow as the night in the midst of the noon day. Well, where are they going to do that? They're going to get to Sela Petra. Because the place that can be dark in the midst of the noon day is Sela Petra. And that place is 50 miles south of the Dead Sea at an elevation of 2,700 feet with a narrow opening uh, two-thirds of a mile long with, wall with walls 300 feet high and 9 feet wide. The only way to uh, make the only way to make their shadow as the night in the midst of the doomed day is to get to that place. And he says, Hide the outcasts, be ray not him that wondereth. So they're, you know, when they get there, they need to Keep the Jews hidden. Don't beray him that wondereth. You know, beray means to reveal or divulge. He's t what he's telling Moab is to help the Jews that run down there to see La Petra when they're running away from the Antichrist, the spoiler, the extortioner, the Antichrist, to hide them and help them. He says in verse 4, Let mine outcast dwell with thee. So when Moab's running away, to safety, let the outcast dwell with them. He says, Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert to them from the face of the spoiler. That's the Antichrist. For the extortioner is at an end, the spoiler ceaseth, the oppressors are consumed out of the land. You see, he's he's saying, you know, take you need to take my side. The spoiler is gonna cease. The extortioner is going to have an end. The oppressors are going to be consumed out of the land. But Jesus Christ, he's not going to be consumed. He's not going to have an end. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. You need to take his side. You need to line up with him. You need to take counsel, execute judgment, and do what the Lord says. And... They can be like the ones in Matthew 25 when the Lord says, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked and in prison and you visited me and whatnot. In Matthew 25, 40, it says, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, And as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was unhungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw thee we unhungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And they shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Those uh, nations that wouldn't help the outcasts in the tribulation, he's not going to deal kindly with them. But the ones that helped him, that helped the outcasts, he's going to deal kindly with them. So he's telling them here, he's telling Moab here, Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert to them from the face of this spoiler. For the extortioner is at an end. The spoiler ceases. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. The, the Lord is going to destroy evil Moab, and the good ones will hide the Jews. So he says, take counsel. Execute judgment. That's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to take counsel. In Proverbs eleven thirteen, 
it says, A tale bearer revealeth secrets, but he that is faithful, but he that is a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. It says, Where no counsel is, in verse 14, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So you need to take counsel. Listen to wise counsel that the Lord's given you. You need to execute judgment. That's what the Lord's looking for is some judgment. In Isaiah 5, 7, he says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment. He's looking for judgment. And in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one, he says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. The Lord's looking for judgment. You need to take counsel. You need to execute judgment. He says in Isaiah 16, 5, And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment. You see, he's looking for judgment. He's a judge. He's the judge of all the earth. Judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. This is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 1, 32 says, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. You might as well go ahead and listen to him. You might as well take his side. You might as well take his counsel. This is the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on the throne because the only king to ever haste righteousness is going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. In Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end upon the throne of his, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish, establish it with judgment and with judge, justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So you see, he's going to be on the throne of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. He's gonna, that means he's going to bring in the righteousness hastily, quickly. He's not just going to promise something and then it just come in slowly or never come in at all. Like all the rulers today, they promise something and it don't ever even come in. Or by the time it comes in, the person right behind them changes it back to the way it was. No, he's going to bring it in hastily and then it's going to stay in because he's not getting off the throne. It's going to come in quickly. He's going to reign in mercy. He's going to reign in truth. In Psalm 85, Psalm 85, 9 through 13, it says, Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth. And righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. That's the millennial kingdom, when the Lord's reigning in mercy and truth and righteousness. So it says, and in mercy. In Isaiah 16, 5, it says, and in mercy shall the throne be established. Mercy and truth are met together. And shall sit up on it in truth. Mercy and truth. Mercy and truth are met together. It says, And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth. In the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hasting righteousness. Righteousness. So this is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Psalm 89, 13 through 14. Psalm 89, 13 through 14. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice 
and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. Justice and judgment. Mercy and truth. Look at nine, Psalm 96, 12 through 13. Let the field be joyful and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh. For he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. You might as well take his side. Because he's taken over. You might as well take his counsel. You might as well execute judgment. You might as well, this is the next thing, take a knee. You might as well take a knee. Don't be too proud to accept mercy. That's a lot of people's problem. God's offering them mercy. God's offering them grace. God's offering them truth. But they're too proud to accept mercy. It says in verse 6, concerning evil Moab, they won't take a knee. When you need to take a knee. He says, we have heard of the pride of Moab. Very prideful. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud even of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath, but his lies shall not be so. He is very proud. Look at Psalm 10 and verse 2. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the, the devices that they have imagined. The proud ones in the tribulation, they're going to persecute the poor. They're not going to help the outcast. They're not going to be a covert to the outcasts. Pride, haughtiness, wrath, and lies are the reason for Moab's destruction. You see it in the verse. They'll be too proud to help the Jew out during the tribulation, most of them, and you're more like the devil when you're prideful. That's why it says, not a novice lest being lifted up with pride he fallen to the condemnation of the devil, the snare of the devil. You might as well bow down now. You might as well take a side, take his side now. You might as well take a knee. Don't wait until you have to take a knee. You're all going to bow to Jesus Christ one day anyway. You might as well do it now and do it humbly and sincerely. So it says, we have heard of the pride of Moab. They're not humble at all. You're not humble at all. You need to take a knee. You need to humble yourself before the king that's coming in to judge at seeking judgment hasting righteousness it says in verse 7 therefore shall Moab howl for Moab everyone shall howl they're going to be howling for their self saying woe is me Moab will howl for Moab it's all about them just like with everybody else it's, it's all about them for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. All just simply seem to worry about their self. In uh, James 5 and verse 1, it says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. That's the only thing you're doing. You're just heaping together treasure for the last days. You might as well take his side, take his counsel, take a knee, humble yourself. Quit being prideful like Moab is here in this chapter. He says... In verse 7, Therefore shall Moab howl for Moab, everyone shall howl. For the foundations of Kir Harasheth shall ye mourn, surely they are stricken. For the fields of Heshbon languish. Their fields are going to languish. They're going to be losing strength. They're going to wither. They're going to fade. In the tribulation, that's what's going to happen. Their fields are going to languish. Joel 1.4 in Joel chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, That which the palmer worm 
hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the cankerworm eaten, and that which the cankerworm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Then in Revelation 8, 7, during the tribulation, it says, The first angel sounded, and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up. The fields are going to languish. For the fields of Heshbon languish, and the vine of Sibma, the lords of the heathen have broken down the principal plants thereof, they are come even unto Jazer. They wandered through the wilderness. Her branches are stretched out. They're gone over the sea. Branches stretched out. You see, many are like trees. Her branches are stretched out. Their enemies are going to cover them like branches stretched out across them. Their branches, her branches are gone over the sea. You might as well go ahead and take a knee. You might as well go ahead and shed some tears now. Because look at verse 9. Therefore I will be well with the weeping of Jazer, the vine of Sibma. I will water thee with my tears, O Heshbon and Elali, for the shouting, for thy summer fruits, and for thy harvest is fallen. He's going to take away their food. No food equals no joy. And Isaiah is saying, I will water thee with my tears. You see, Isaiah's got the same mindset as God. God doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. And Isaiah is saying he's going to be tore up about it. And he's going to water their vines with his tears. He's going to be so tore up about it. You see, the Lord doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. He says in Ezekiel 33, 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? You might as well turn from your evil way and do what you know the Lord would have you do. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter three and verse 9. You might as well take a knee, humble up, shed some tears. Therefore I will be well with the weeping of Jaser. I will water thee with my tears. It says in verse 10, And gladness is taken away. You see, no food is no joy. And joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards, there shall be no singing. People sing when they're happy. There's not going to be any singing. No singing shows a lack of joy. Neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. And I have made their vintage shouting to cease. He says, tread out wine in their presses. Now, if it's wine in the presses, that shows you that sometimes when the Bible refers to wine, it's talking about just the grape juice because it can't be alcoholic wine. It can't be fermented wine right off the presses, you see. So sometimes when the Bible's talking about wine, it's talking about grape juice. Proverbs 3.10 says, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. New wine in the Bible is grape juice. The presses burst with new wine. It's not fermented yet. Just right off the presses. In Isaiah 65, 8. Says. Thus saith the Lord. As the new wine is found in the cluster. That's like a cluster of grapes. New wine is grape juice. So you know it's new wine if it's still in the press. But the Lord's going to take it away. He's going to take away the wine. Psalm 104.15 Psalm 104.15 Verse 15 says, And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth the man's heart. 
So the wine that maketh glad the heart of man, that's going to be taken away from Moab. There'll be no joy. You see, God has taken away their joy. Gladness is taken away. Joy out of the plentiful field. The vineyard shall there be no more singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. Their vintage is the produce of the vine. And he's going to cause all their shouting to cease. Their singing to cease. They're not going to have no joy. They had too much pride to line up. It says in Amos 8.10, And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. You might as well go ahead and take a knee. You might as well go ahead and take his side. You might as well go ahead and take counsel and do everything that he says. Because if you don't, it's not going to turn out too well. It says in verse 11, Isaiah 16, Wherefore my bowels shall sound like an harp for Moab. Isaiah on the inside, it's going to sound like a sad song. It's going to sound like a funeral song. On, he's, on the inside, he's going to be all tore up. He's going to be sick at his stomach. You ever seen something bad happen to somebody and you just get sick at your stomach? That's the way Isaiah is, is saying he'll be. He says, Wherefore my bowels, that's the insides of him. My bowels shall be, he's going to sound like a harp for Moab, playing a sad song. And my inward parts for Kir Harish. And it shall come to pass, when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place, that he shall come to his sanctuary to pray, but he shall not prevail. You see, you need to take a knee. You need to pray now. You need to humble up, shed some tears. You need to pray now. Go ahead and start praying now. Moab should have prayed a long time ago at this point. But it shall come to pass when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place. He's up there praying on the high places where he offers his false gods, you know. But he's not getting an answer like those prophets of Baal could not ever get Baal to answer. And Elijah was mocking him, saying, what's he on vacation or something? Is he using the bathroom or something? You know, where's he at? They're not getting no answer up on the high place. They should have went to the Lord. They get weary in their prayers to their false gods because their gods ain't answering them. You see, prayer is like wrestling. And here, Moab isn't going to prevail like Jacob did. Jacob wrestled in prayer back there in Genesis. He prevailed. Moab's not going to prevail. They, they waited too long. Now, the difference between Moab and us is we're saved born-again believers. We're, you know, you, God's not going to turn your prayer away. God wants to talk to you more than you want to talk to Him. And if you go to Him in prayer right now, confessing your sins if we confess our sins he's faithful and just forgive us our sins and cleanse from all unrighteousness we go right into the throne room when we pray we're not uh, fighting for an opportunity for God to hear us God always hears us he's going to listen to you the moment you come back to him you're getting right back into fellowship he's going to hear what you're saying he wants to talk to you more than you want to talk to him but it wasn't. it's not like that for Moab he says, And it shall come to pass when it is seen that Moab is weary on the high place, that he shall come to his sanctuary to pray, but he shall not prevail. The Lord's not going to listen to him. This isn't born-again believers in the body of Christ we're talking about. It says in Proverbs 128, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Now, you're, God's going to answer. God's going to hear you every time you call upon him. He may not answer every prayer you pray, but He's going to hear you every time you call upon Him. He's going to listen to you. If you come to the Lord with sincere heart in fellowship with Him, He's going to listen to you. Don't let the devil think, well, well, God's not hearing you. you got all this sin in your life. God's not hearing you. If you're coming to Him with a sincere heart, wanting to be in fellowship with Him, you're getting back in fellowship with Him. 
see a lot of times the, uh, there's uh, sermons that'll make you think, well, well, what's the point of even praying? God's not going to hear me. They make it seem like you almost got to be perfect to even pray. And those type of sermons can be a hindrance to people's prayers, prayer life. But he's they're, Moab's going to be weary on the high place. False gods ain't going to hear them. And they're going to finally come to the Lord. They're going to take a knee, but it's going to be too late for them. It says, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning Moab since that time. So Isaiah saying, this is the word of the Lord. So don't shoot the messenger. I'm the messenger. I'm just telling you. He says, but now the Lord hath spoken, saying, within three years as the years of an hireling, and the glory of Moab shall be contemned, like scorn, despised, with all that great multitude, and the remnant shall be very small and feeble. So in three years, the greatness of Moab is going to be destroyed and their population reduced. They're going to be down to a very small remnant. That remnant's going to need to send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness. They're going to need to hide the outcasts and be a covert for, the, for them Jews. And those, see, the Lord has spoken, saying, within three years... Like the last three and a half years of the trib, within three years, as the years of an hireling. Three years is the years of an, an hireling, somebody that's hired to do something. You know, they say a pastor stays at a church about three years. A person stays, you know, uh, faithful to a church about three years. So if you've got a pastor that's been faithful longer than three years, or people that's been faithful longer than three years, you need to really be thankful for that person because the years of an hireling is three years that's about how long they last but you see a remnant should be very small and feeble you need to see yourself this way realize you're small and feeble but God is big you're small and feeble you need to take his side you're helpless without him. You're small and feeble. You need to take his counsel. You're small and feeble. You need to take a knee. You need to humble yourself. Don't be like prideful Moab. You need to shed some tears now. You need to pray now. Because the Lord has spoken within three years as the years of an hireling. And the glory of Moab shall be contemned with all that great multitude. And the remnant shall be very small and feeble. You see... In Isaiah chapter 16, only a remnant of Moab will survive in the tribulation, and the ones who do will need to go to Selah Petra, send a lamb to the ruler of the land, send tribute to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, chapter 16 of Isaiah will line up with Nehemiah, the 16th book of the Bible. And if you look down at Isaiah 16, 10, it says, And gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards there shall be no singing, neither shall there be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine in their presses. I have made their vintage shouting to cease. So this is going to match Nehemiah chapter 5. Because like I said, the 66 books of Isaiah go along with the 66 books of the Bible. And it says, over in Nehemiah, it's going to mention the sorrow of the people because the field and the vine, is, it talks about the vine stopping to produce. In Nehemiah 5, 1, it says, And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren, the Jews, for there were that said, We, our sons and our daughters, are many. Therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands, vineyards, see that, and houses, that we might buy corn because of the dearth. And then you look down at verse 6, and it says, And I was very angry when I heard their cry and these words. 
And he talks about in verse 4, it talks about vineyards again. So in Nehemiah, they're in sorrow and crying over their vineyards. Just like in Isaiah 16, you got people crying and sorrowing over their vineyards. You see how you can find something in each chapter of Isaiah that lines up with the coinciding chapter of the Bible. And it's like God uses the book of Isaiah to confirm to you that you've got the 66 books. Isaiah, they call it the mini Bible. But realize you're small and feeble and that God is big. Take his side. Take his counsel. Take a knee.